With this in hand, we are quite equipped to begin an assault on the question of what does k red balls in a row say about the chance of a k plus one -th red ball in a row? Recall the implicit measure places equal mass on the events a0, a1 through an, and gives you conditional probabilities in a very natural sense. Now, suppose we ask, what can I say about the probability that k red balls in a row were chosen from whichever urn was selected? The event h sub k is now stands in the role of the event h in the definition of conditional probability on your upper right. We naturally decompose this event in terms of the ancillary events a0, a1 through an, which tell us which urn was selected. And now we've got a chain rule for conditional probability. Observe that in this sum, it was more natural to begin the sum at j equal to 0 and run it all the way up till n. The implicit specification of the probability measure reduces the sum into a nice and simple form. Now, at this step, the probabilistic intuition in the problem is exhausted. Okay. We've now got a sum. The sum may or may not be reducible in terms of simpler elements, but now the probability or chance elements are exhausted. But of course, we don't want to leave a sum in that form. We'd like to see if we can simplify it, get some information from what the nature of the sum is. In particular, we'd like to say something about what happens to such a sum if the number of possibilities for n's, if the number of balls n, is very large. Now, let's write the sum out explicitly. So the sum mans are of the form an integer over n to the power k, and they're multiplied by values 1 over n plus 1. Recall n is a large number. So we've got these small increments, 1 over n plus 1, multiplying a power of k. This begins to look familiar. We've seen sums like this on the pathway in the basic calculus on the pathway to integrals. Let's focus on again, what are the things we're adding? We're adding weighted powers of k. Well, let's take a look at a power of k. Right? Naturally enough, we call it x to the power k. x runs from 0 to 1, and we've got a smooth increasing curve. What does each summand look like? Right? If you look at, say, the jth summand, it's got a height, j over n to the power k. And so that gives you the height of the curve x to the power k at the point j over n. It's multiplied by 1 over n plus 1. If we subdivide the unit interval into n plus 1 pieces, each of width n 1 over n plus 1, then the jth term corresponds to a rectangle of height j over n to the power k and width 1 over n plus 1. And therefore, the jth term is identified as the area under the jth rectangle. When you sum over all these terms, we're summing areas of a sequence of rectangles. As n becomes large, these rectangles get closer and closer and closer to the area under the curve. We begin to recognize a Riemann sum as an approximation to an ordinary garden variety Riemann integral. And this integral is particularly simple and beguiling. And so if we now make the natural step and say n is large, then the sum in question is indeed an approximation to the integral from 0 to 1 of x to the power k. But of course, this is a completely elementary integral. And we evaluate it, and we find that the answer is beguiling in its simplicity. Under this probability model, for repeated selections of balls from a random urn, the chance that k red balls are drawn in a row is approximately 1 over k plus 1. And the approximation gets tighter and tighter and tighter the larger n becomes. We are now equipped to answer the following question. Given that r red balls in a row have been drawn, what is the chance that the next draw will result in a red ball. 
From a mathematical perspective, this is equivalent to asking what is the conditional probability of the occurrence of the event HR plus 1, given that the event HR has occurred. Now we promptly just write down the definition of conditional probability. And we get a ratio of probabilities. And the key here is to observe that the events HR and HR plus 1 stand in a particular relation. HR plus 1 means that R plus 1 red balls have been observed. But if R plus 1 red balls were drawn, then manifestly it is true that R red balls must have been drawn prior to that. And therefore, the event HR plus 1 will imply the occurrence of the event HR. From a set theoretic perspective, the event HR plus 1 is a subset of HR, and therefore the intersection of the two results in the smaller of the two sets. In other words, simply HR plus 1. And therefore, the conditional probability in question devolves into a ratio of probabilities. HR plus 1 in the numerator, HR in the denominator. And now we simply plug in our beautiful Riemann approximation. And if we do this, we discover that the conditional probability of drawing a red ball, given that our red balls have been drawn, differs from 1 only in the reciprocal of r plus 2. One could hardly ask for a simpler, cleaner explanation. Now, before we go back to Laplace, let's do a quick sanity check. And to make sure that we have the mechanism under control, let's ask the following question. What can we say about the probability that Given that R red balls have been drawn in a row, the next S draws result in red balls. In other words, what is the probability of the event HR plus S conditioned upon the occurrence of the event HR? Take a minute and see if you can work out an approximation. If we follow through exactly the same line of argument as is sketched above, we find that the probability is given by the ratio of r plus 1 to s plus r plus 1. And the argument is exactly the same. How does this fit in with the original question in that Laplace phrased? Uh, to get a proper understanding would require a careful historical study to get at what Laplace intended by this kind of analogy. But one could imagine making a tenuous connection. If we replace balls by, let's say, universes, a large number of potential universes, one of which is chosen at random, and then we model the sun rising every day on the Earth as a random experiment with replacement, whatever that means, in that given universe, then we have, in a very, very vague and tenuous way, a connection to the zone problem. And of course, as I've said, to get at a real understanding of what Laplace meant, we'd really have to undertake a detailed historical study, and that would take us a little far afield. As a side note, right, uh, remarkably, these ideas of multiple universes are now gaining currency in various models of a quantum mechanical universe. Right? But that takes us further afield. Let's come back to Laplace. Right? The kind of mathematical analysis we have undertaken is impeccable. The probability models there, the probability space, is clear. There is no ambiguity. And therefore, the conclusions are also very, very clear. The connection with the original question of the sun rising is much more tenuous. This requires a measure of faith in some underlying stylized, sanitized model of randomness, which, of course, is, would be highly debatable in uh, the best of times. Yeah. 
even if one were willing to buy into an argument involving a large number of universes, the Laplacian kind of argument captured in that quote from Laplace would posit the occurrence of the following event, that the sun has risen for a large number of days, about 1.8 million days, without a break. Of course, we believe in something like that for the same reason as we believe that the sun will rise tomorrow. Of course, the underlying uh, foundation for our belief structure here we draw from the mechanical universe of Isaac Newton and simple models of physics which allow us to predict and test various hypotheses. Laplace, of course, was quite cognizant of this. And so here is another quote which tells us that this kind of analysis should, in context like this, should be taken with a large pinch of salt. Uh, 